questions? Oh. We are being recorded. I, yeah. Um, thank you to whoever's recording. I forgot to press that button. So thank you. Um, I think we can just about begin. Looks like almost everybody's here that we can expect. Thank you for coming to week uh, day five of Power in the Spirit, Advent in July. Today is Christmas, according to our Power in the Spirit calendar. So Merry Christmas. Uh, we're going to continue to uh, look at what it means to direct our hopes. Um, in a time season of waiting, what does it mean to direct our hopes in the right direction? And I'm excited about um, Pastor Kathy Mims offering her second presentation tonight on the topic of coaching and um, how that could be an important thing for us to think about um, as um, the pandemic subsides. And I, um, I think it is worth noting all of us, um, Pastor Mims, uh, the planning team, um, uh, those of us on Synod staff, uh, we are very much aware when we talk about the pandemic subsiding, we're talking about our corner of the world. Um, it's uh, unfortunately um, not the case everywhere um, that, that um, they're seeing the sort of progress uh, that we're seeing. It's just something to worth, uh, that's worth noting um, since we've used that language uh, during our time together that uh, we're talking about our experience and that's, that's not the same experience everywhere you go in the world. Um, hopefully that will change and hopefully we can um, uh, be empowered to be part of that change uh, for the sake of the world. Uh, before we begin, I have a couple of announcements. I want to let you know that um, I'm really looking forward to being back in person next uh, summer, next July 2022, uh, Thursday, July 14th uh, through July 16th. And uh, it will be real exciting to welcome uh, Beth Lewis and Rick Rouse uh, in person. They were workshop leaders this last week. And um, It'll be very exciting to welcome them here to Roanoke College, and I hope you'll come and I hope you'll invite somebody. Uh, so that's uh, next July around this time. And um, before then, I do want to let you know the details may shift between now and February, uh, but we do plan a midwinter event that will be online, and that's going to be centered on Candlemas, which is February 2nd. So the exact dates aren't firm. Um, we've done Sunday through Thursday, but I think it's important to every step of the way be asking, um, do we need to do it exactly the way we did last year? So, um, so I'm open-minded about that, but we have committed to offering some sort of online midwinter power in the spirit uh, event around that time. So just be aware. Um, if you can't remember when Candlemas is, it is the exact same day as Groundhog Day. And that may be easier to remember. So it's always going to be February 2nd um, around then. And we will, that's an event that's planned from the ground up as an online uh, event for Power in the Spirit. So a little different than trying to figure out how to take a, an in-person event and do something like that online when we plan from the beginning for this to be an online time for learning and fellowship and worship. Uh, Pastor John Wirtz has something to share with us. I'm going to invite him to yeah so um, the synod is in the process of updating our uh giving website uh and so if you looked at the link that we dropped in the uh, the chat last night uh, and the one i just dropped in the chat right now uh it's the new version that's coming there's uh, a few things that need to be done yet uh before it can be full out ready to go for everything um, but hopefully you're seeing that page now uh, as to what it uh, what it look like. Uh, so it's going to be a little different approach instead of the, the sort of lines of things that you've seen in the past. Uh, what's coming will be um, a little more colorful, a little easier to uh, to follow and to find uh, what you're looking for. So you all get to help us uh, preview it tonight. Uh, if you are interested in making a gift towards uh, supporting the ministry in Papua New Guinea, um, this is the link that we've dropped in that you'll have a chance to use and as you use it, uh, if you uh, if you have questions, if you have thoughts, um, I'd love to hear them because, like I said, this is we're moving in that direction. We're probably still a couple of months away from full implementation, but we thought we'd give you all a little preview and give it a try. So thank you. 
Thank you, John. So that link is active now and that'll work for giving a gift. And 100% of what comes in to Power in the Spirit this summer is going towards uh, Papua New Guinea. So um, this is a ministry the Virginia Synod has provided for you, um, uh, this, uh, this event and this time together. Uh, do earlier, yes, earlier donations do count. Good question, Claire. Yeah. Um, and we know, I mean, there, people don't often randomly give money to power in the spirit. So we just know wherever, however it's coming in around this time of year, it's intended to be a gift uh, to Papua New Guinea is how we know how to, how to direct that gift in the right direction. But good, good question. Um, thank you. Um, I want to say thank you again to the Virginia Senate staff. Uh, Lene Osmondson, Tammy Casper, and uh, Becky Walls have been really instrumental in um, keeping this event uh, working. So my thanks to the three of you and also to Pastor John Wirtz and Colleen Mont Pastor Colleen Montgomery for your help uh, with um, especially keeping the website updated. There's a lot more thank yous to go out and that'll um, be part of an e email that goes out tomorrow morning. Um, so it won't be a devotional tomorrow, but it will include an evaluation. Let us know what you liked about this year's event. Um, let us know what you think could be different next time. And um, also pay attention to um, uh, everybody who participated in making this event work. Uh, members of the Power in the Spirit Committee and uh, our volunteer pastors who offered uh, video reflections or chimed in with um, uh, devotional materials. And um, yeah, I do want to make a special note of thanking uh, George Donovan, music director at uh, Bethel Lutheran Church in Winchester, for providing us with a, a, just some wonderful evening prayer services um, all, all week long. It's really been a great way to, to close, the, um, uh, close each night. So uh, thank you, George. He can't be with us tonight because he's leading his choir, um, but uh, uh, he really knocked it out of the park and used a new resource, All Creation Sings, um, which I really appreciated its approach to the theme of darkness uh, in a different way than we often speak of darkness in the church. Um, so we have other ways of talking about light shining in the darkness, like from the Gospel of John, um, but it really taps, taps into um, darkness as protective or darkness as a creative space as well, uh, which is also uh, throughout our scriptures. Um, there are times when um, the psalmist writes of, we need to hide from the sun because the sun will, um, you know, give us a sunburn. So the shade is a good thing. And I don't, there's more complicated imagery uh, behind uh, these things. And uh, All Creation Sings includes some great ways uh, in the season of Advent to um, think about this imagery in a new way. And so uh, those uh, liturgies from George will be on the Power and the Spirit website uh, in perpetuity. So uh, if, it, if you get to Advent planning in your own church and you want to uh, go back to take a look at what we did here at Power and the Spirit, uh, that's, that's going to be there for you. So I hope you'll think about that. We do thank George and the people of Bethel Lutheran Church. And I will say thanks again to Kathy Mims, Pastor Kathy Mims from First Lutheran Church and also the coordinator for the coaching ministry of the Virginia Senate, this uh, relatively new ministry of our Senate, but something that I think is gonna be really important for the church in the long run, um, especially as we think about what to do next. Uh, the, the, um, the urge to go back to the way it was March 12th 2020, as opposed to what we're being called to really do next um, and paying attention to that. I think that urge is strong and I hope coaching can be part of directing us in the right way. So thank you. Thank you again, Pastor Mims, for being with us for this event. Well, thank you again for inviting me uh, and for all of you who have come out. Um, it is a great um, pleasure to be with you this evening, again, to talk about things that I love, um, Advent, and coaching. And so again, I'm going to share my screen uh, with my PowerPoint. Um, get that queued up. So we are here for Advent in July. And on um, Sunday night, I left with you know a couple of questions. Let me start the slideshow here. Um, that I want to focus on this evening. 
So one, how do Advent and coaching help us process what we've been through over the past 16 months for all of the changes and the turmoil, the trauma, how does Advent and, and the themes of Advent and the coaching uh, process help us um, kind of think through all that we've been through? Uh, and then how do COVID, uh, excuse me, Advent and coaching help us imagine life in, as David mentioned, this almost post-pandemic time? Um, again, knowing that there are variants out there and there are other places in our country and in the world that are are not as open as, as we are. Um, but as we start to open up, um, regather and have um, activities in our congregations, in our churches, um, regather for worship, how do Advent and coaching help us? What, what could be? Uh, and then what do Advent and coaching call us to in this present time? So these are some of the things that we're gonna be looking at tonight and some of the questions we're gonna be answering. So I wanna review a little bit. And to start, I wanna show the video tonight that I did not show Sunday night on coaching. Um, a little bit, just kind of a reminder of what coaching is. When you hear the word coaching, what springs to mind? Football coach, acting coach, vocal coach, maybe even a financial coach. Confusing, isn't it? Well, coach has become such a popular title that it's being used by lots of professions, often with no training. Now, sometimes coaching is just a fancy way of saying, I'll ask you a few questions and then tell you what I think you should do. Well, let's clear the air a little bit about coaching. Coaching is often confused with therapy, consulting, and mentoring. Now, those are great helping professions, but they're not professional coaching. Here's the difference. Therapists focus on the past and work to fix what's broken. Consultants provide quantitative analysis and create roadmaps for organizational change. They get paid to provide answers. Mentors help those with less experience. Mentors are already experts in their field and are helping others reach success. Now, there may be some overlaps in approach, but none of these are professional coaching. Professional coaching is a different type of conversation. There's a whole lot of asking and not much telling. Professional coaches are focused on you, helping you design your future, your goals. They're thought-provoking and inspirational. You work on your topic. A professional coach focuses on you. Professional coaches are also discerning listeners, empathetic, creative, intuitive, and curious. They're trained in coaching behaviors and competencies, which makes them really good coaches, and they're bound by professional standards and ethics. A professional coach will be your partner, your advocate, your champion. So some of the things to remember and to lift up from that would be um, the differences between coaching and um, therapy and mentoring and um, consultation, uh, because it's a different type of conversation. And so uh, we, the, in coaching, it's about, um, powerful questions, asking questions that get you thinking about yourself. And it's very much client centered. It's, it's being curious about what your goals are and what you want to achieve. So, so that gives us a sense um, of what coaching is. Let's review a little bit about the themes of Advent. If you recall, we spoke about how um, Advent has three different types of waiting. We wait, we have a waiting that looks back um, to the promises that God has fulfilled. And so we talk, we, we look to, to the celebration of Jesus' birth and we, um, we, we recite the, the prophecies that, um, that told us about Christ's birth and how Christ fulfills um, those promises that God had, had made. And there's also the, the Advent waiting that looks to the future, that our expectant hope of, of what will one day be when Jesus returns in the fullness of time and, and we are invited to that marriage feast uh, in heaven where there's a new heaven and a new earth, no more tears, no more mourning, no more death. Uh, and so there's the waiting to the, to, that looks to the back. There's the waiting that looks to the future. Um, and there's the waiting that remains in the presence, a waiting that is sustained by the practices of our faith, a waiting that we've all experienced that often is painful and um, 
uh, can, can be fearful, can cause us to worry. Um, and, and when we're grounded and rooted in our faith, when we're grounded and rooted in the promises that God has fulfilled and the promises yet to be fulfilled, um, we can be held and sustained in, in these anxious times um, and in the present. <clears throat> so there's, there's um, these three different types of waiting. Uh, and, and Advent has specific practices centered around different themes uh, that we focus on. So there's prayer and meditation and contemplation and silence that center around these ideas of being alert, of staying awake, being attentive to where um, God is doing things, um, where God is coming to us. Um, there's the themes of repentance um, and of preparing the way because the Lord is near. And that is the promise of Advent, that the Lord is near. Uh, and so that's just kind of a um, recap of what we covered on Sunday, a very uh, brief kind of recap of the themes of Advent um, and, and then what coaching is. So now I wanna take us on a little bit of a side path. So, so hold on to that and, and just go with me for a little bit. This is going to seem like it doesn't, doesn't fit, but, but I will bring it all back together again. So I want to introduce you to a book called Meta Moments. Um, Dave Daubert is a pastor in the ELCA and one of the authors of this book. And um, it, it has nothing to do with coaching or with Advent, uh, but it is an excellent little book. And it's, it is, it's short. It'd be a great book for um, like a uh, Council devotions, if you have your council read through it uh, over the course of six to eight months, um, or for small groups to go over, it, it really is, a, is an excellent uh, little book. And he speaks about these, these meta moments, these moments of transformation in, in people's lives and in, um, in the church. Now, this word meta is a Greek preposition, and it's got several different meanings depending on how it's used. It can mean after or with or beyond. Um, uh, Dave Dalbert uses it in terms of uh, meaning in the midst of something, in the middle of something, because uh, these meta moments occur within the midst of, of community. Um, so that is a word that has a lot of different meanings. Um, it's also, I, I discovered, um, a very popular word among young people. Um, my, um, my son is a, is a gamer and he was talking about something being really meta. I had no idea what he was talking about, but he said it had something to do with gaming. I don't understand that kind of meta, but the Greek meta I, I, can, I can get uh, in terms of it being a preposition. Um, but it's also used, and this comes out of this book, um, in reference to something called the Circus Maximus. I know, I told you, I said I was going to take you out on this like strange uh, path. And, and, and so I just want you to bear with me as we talk about the Circus Maximus, which is this valley in, in kind of the middle of, of two big um, hills in Rome. And that is where chariot races were held <clears throat> um, during the, you know, the ancient Roman Empire. Uh, and it was, it was huge. It could seat nearly 200,000 spectators. And it was the scene of these um, just spectacles of, of these chariot races that could often be um, very violent and dangerous, um, but they were, in, the masses were enthralled by these events. Um, and so you can see this is kind of a present day of this, this grassy area where it would, would be held. Here is a picture of what it would have looked like um, when the races were actually taking place. Uh, and so you can see where the crowds would, um, would be sitting. And then uh, the races would take place around here. <clears throat> and uh, so, the, and the reference here, the important point here, is, is these places where they, the, they would make the turns. And these places are called the meta. And that was like the central, important decision-making um, point for the charioteers. Like they had to make that turn just right in order to either be able to continue the race or to win the race or there could be sp spectacular crashes at those points, which means you've lost the race. Those crashes were often called shipwrecks. Um, but that, those, those turning places were incredibly important 
to being able to win the race, to make that turn and go in the other direction. Uh, and, and so as you get close to that, close to the meta, you are drawing close to a place of great significance. So it's an important location in the race. And so where that ties in with what we're talking about is this wonderful word called metanoia. Uh, which means repentance. And of course, this is a theme that John the Baptist brings up and we hear about in Advent. Um, here I've got Matthew chapter three. In those days, John the Baptist appeared in the wilderness of Judea, proclaiming, repent, for the kingdom of heaven has come near. Now, I think we often have a confusing notion of repentance as simply being sorry for our sins, like it's, it's just something that, you know, I'm so sorry, I, I, I messed up, God, please forgive me, uh, you know, we're repenting. Um, but repentance really has a deeper meaning than that. Um, it really is, and I'm going to go back a screen here if I can. It really is about you're going in one direction, and you realize it's the wrong direction, and you need to make a 180 turn. You need to make the meta. You need to turn in your way of life. So it is a spiritual change. It is something that is deep within um, because it affects how you um, function and behave and act uh, and live your life afterward. And so it, repentance requires this thoughtfulness and intentionality that simply, um, that often apologizing from our sins doesn't, doesn't do. It's, it's much deeper than that. Um, it really is an intentional uh, change empowered by the Holy Spirit um, in the way we live. <clears throat> Paul speaks about this in a little different way. He talks about, let us run the, with perseverance the race that is set before us, looking to Jesus, the pioneer and perfecter of our faith. And so here, Paul is speaking about this in terms of encouraging people to offer their best, to keep pressing forward, even when the way is difficult. Uh, to continue to follow Jesus, to continue to make the right decisions, to continue to do what is godly, um, even, even when it's hard and difficult. And we are really relying um, upon the power of God to do that so that we can make it around that meta, so that we can make that turn, so that we can do what, uh, what we know we need to do um, as, as followers of Jesus. Um, and so... Taking all of that in, that's a lot of information. How does coaching and Advent intersect? So let me try to pull all of this together for us tonight. So just as Advent invites us to wait, await to awaiting that looks to the past, coaching invites congregations to reflect on their past. And, and in particular, since we're in the midst of this pandemic, to reflect on the past 16 months, what has been difficult, what and who has been lost, and, and how do we grieve that? Um, you know, so, you know, being able as a congregation to be able to sit with these hard questions and to sit with that time um, and, and, and to pay attention to all of the things that happened, to the feelings and emotions that, that um, uh, the congregation experienced and to identify where God was present. Um, in, in the past 16 months. And then just as Advent invites us to a waiting that looks to the future with an expectant hope, coaching can invite congregations to dream for the future, to think about what they've learned in the past 16 months that they want to continue doing um, in the future. What can they not let go of? What has become so important to the congregation that they need to hold on to it into the future? Again, that could be a, a meta moment because it requires some intentional um, intentionality and, and, some, and possibly some real change. And then as Advent um, uh, invites us to wait in the present, sustained by the practices of our faith, coaching invites congregations to live more fully in the present, um, to, to take what has been in the past, to take that expectant hope and to bring it into their lives today. So how will you lament and honor what has been lost? How will you celebrate coming together again? Um, how do you move forward uh, and into some of those things that you're dreaming about? Um, so these, these are, um, these are what, what coaches would call 
powerful questions. And if you notice, not a single one of them can be answered with a yes or a no. They are invited into some deep thinking uh, and to some self-evaluation, um, whether it's as an individual or as a congregation. Um, and you can use these, con these questions like on your own, in your own congregation. You could have a, a you could do this in your council, you could do this as a congregational event. Um, what coaching provides on top of this is the ability to go a little bit deeper. So if there's an event that was really emotional, um, to be able to say, you know, what's, what's behind uh, that emotion? Um, or if there's, there's something that um, just seems really difficult that you want to do, a coach can, can say, well, let's take a closer look at, 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 at what seems to be um, impossible or obstacles and, and how can we work around those. So, so what a coach can do is go a little bit deeper um, with the, the things that congregations bring up. Uh, but certainly this could be used just as, as conversation starters within the congregation to begin thinking about what we've been through and how we move forward. And then there's the, that self-examination and intentional reflection that um, uh, aligns with the work of repentance. Um, and so here are just some other questions. You know, what has given you hope and sustained you through the long days of the pandemic? How have you been changed through the pandemic? Where have you been called to change direction in your ministry? Um, and where do you need to persevere even though the way is difficult? So these can invite questions, uh, invite congregations into um, even deeper reflection, not so much on maybe the mechanics of ministry um, or, or how to get from point A to point B, but really that work of, of growth and trusting in the presence and power of God uh, to sustain them through that time of growth. Um, so, so this is, um, a, again, I know it's a lot, um, but what I'd like to do is to break us up into some smaller groups. Uh, and um, Lene is going to put these questions in the chat so you will have them. And I would say, let's give ourselves about 15 minutes. There's a lot of questions and there's some, uh, you know, room for, for conversation there. Um, so I'm going to uh, suggest we break into small groups for 15 minutes. And as I said, Lene will have those questions in the chat and then we'll come back to, to wrap things up. We'll be ready to go with the rooms in just a second. All right. Okay, the room should be open. You should have an invitation to join your breakout room. Um, just kind of curious how the conversations went. Is there anything anybody would like to share from those conversations? If you, if you, I can't, I can't see a whole lot. So you may have to raise your emoji to raise your hand. I think one of the things is how communion has changed mm -hmm. and yet how each of us, each of our congregations have persevered during that time. Yeah. And uh, some of the things and changes may be permanent. Mm -hmm. uh, Zoom is something new. Uh, showing your services on Facebook maybe is something new. So things have changed, maybe some for the good. Yeah, yeah. I, I, I suspect um, that many congregations like my own, we were thrust into a, a, a digital age that we were not prepared for. Uh, we, had to, we had to learn a lot of new technology very quickly, um, but 
gosh, what a great way to reach people. Um, you know, the digital age has no geographical boundaries. So that, that has some, some benefit to it. What else were some of the things you talked about uh, in your group? Uh, having people join the uh, uh, online experience from different states. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Isn't that kind of exciting to see, uh, oh my gosh, there's someone from Wisconsin here, or there's yeah. someone from Arizona or whatever. I mean, it's, it's, it's pretty mm -hmm. amazing. Well, uh, what questions might you have? <clears throat> Well, let's see. So I did want to say that um, in terms of coaching, uh, if you um, and your congreg congregation are interested in coaching, um, let me, I can put my contact information in the chat real quick. Um, and uh, you can, can reach out to me if you are interested in having a coach come. Let me get this in here. If you are interested in um, having uh, a coach come and work with your uh, council or with congregational leaders, uh, we can certainly um, arrange for that to happen. Um, if you're interested in becoming a coach, you can also reach out to me. I'd love to have that conversation with you um, uh, to, to look at, at kind of what the training options are. Um, so uh, in terms of utilizing a coach, becoming a coach, um, uh, those are conversations I love to have. Oh, that's a good question. What kinds of questions should congregations ask themselves to determine whether they would like to explore a coaching experience? That's a great question. Um, and, and a lot of it has to do, I think, that uh, if there is a, I don't know if it's questions to ask or if it's just kind of coming to the awareness that we, we want to move to a new place, um, but we're not sure how to get there. We need someone to help us think it through. Um, or if we're feeling stuck uh, and, and, and need some, some motivation to move forward, I think those are, are things to be thinking about um, uh, when considering whether or not a coach would be helpful for a congregation. Uh, if you're looking for the answer or for the right plan to take for your congregation, a coach is not the person to, to uh, reach out to. Um, but if you, if you, even if you have a, just kind of a, a, an idea of where you want to go, um, uh, a coach can help you get there. Um, so that, 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 that coach can help, help with that journey. What other questions might you have? Oh, I was, now I forgot my question. Oh. <laughs> Had to get unmuted. <laughs> um, I was wondering if I understand the concept of coaching, but that if you have, which is very often disagreements with, within the group that you're coaching, mm -hmm. is the coach prepared to uh, mediate between the two different uh, factions in a group, like is that absolutely? Um, and and part of part of what has to be agreed upon is kind of what is the end end goal. Like so, if 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 there are two sides that say we want to do it this way, and another side that says no, we want to do it this way, well, that gets to be a little bit more difficult. But if there is a unified sense of this is where we need to go, then disagreements along the way are actually really healthy and helpful. But you have to come to that that goal first. Well, but I think a coach can also help get to that goal too. They, there can be some some clarifying questions as to getting down to um, what 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 the congregation values and how it understands its mission um, can help um, uh, uh, really focus that where, where they're wanting to go to. let me um, share my screen one last time. I want to close with another Advent reading. Um, we have time for one more question? We do. Okay. <laughs> um, I was curious, uh, 
think it was on Sunday night, you mentioned um, churches celebrating some of the things they've done the yeah. last year and a half. Yes. How do I do that without making it look like we're celebrating me? <laughs> you know, or like, or there's like some practical ways to say, how did we as a church get through this year? Um, and I, I don't know, I'm just, I'm, that yeah. struck a chord with me, but. You know, you know. I, I think it can be as big as, it, it, there are a variety of ways of, of looking at that. One of the things that, that comes to my mind is, um, uh, it, so I'll use my congregation as, as an example. So like many others, we had a group of people who sewed hundreds of masks. We also had a quilting group was just, I mean, they were stuck at home, their home. So what were they gonna do? They made quilts along with the masks. Um, we also um, really amped up our feeding ministry. So one of the things I could envision doing is um, uh, in, in worship one Sunday, displaying samples of the work that's been done and commending that to God and, and thanking God for the opportunity to serve. Um, you know, a celebration might even be like just having an ice cream social <laughs> out in a courtyard just to celebrate being able to get back together again. Um, so it's, it's really just taking, um, again, that intentionality is really important. Um, to think about what it is we want to celebrate and, and what, are, what ways do we do that? Um, and sometimes that can be really hard to think about, to, to come up with ideas of, of how to celebrate. Sometimes, um, you know, a, a, a thank you banner <laughs> um, as people are coming in for their perseverance and for their faithfulness and ge continued generosity um, can be a way of, of celebrating um, the ministry that has continued even through the pandemic. Absolutely. Uh, all right, so let me share my screen one more time. And let me close with this Advent reading from Philippians. And this is um, a prayer for you. Rejoice in the Lord always. Again, I will say rejoice. Let your gentleness be known to everyone. For the Lord is near. Do not worry about anything, but in everything, by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God. And the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. Amen. Thank you so much for um, letting me be a part of your uh, power in the spirit experience and to share with you my love for coaching. Thank you so much. Thank you, Pastor Mims. Appreciate you sharing. And uh, your uh, email address is in our chat. So folks who want to know more about coaching or think about this as uh, something useful in, uh, in their context, uh, we'll know how to reach you and appreciate you um, uh, leading this, this new ministry and making yourself available uh, to our entire Synod. Um, I don't think I have any other announcements other than um, uh, worship uh, will come next. And once again, we thank um, George Donovan, Director of Music at Bethel Lutheran Church and the members of his music ministry for providing worship tonight. I will share my screen with you. Good evening and welcome to our final gathering of worship as we close out Power in the Spirit 2021. On behalf of us here at Bethel Lutheran in Winchester, I want to say thank you uh, for allowing us to be a part of worship and Power in the Spirit this year. And I want to say a big thank you to my team here that has helped with putting and recording these services this week. Tonight our worship kind of has a similar yet different approach than our previous worship this week has. Tonight we'll observe a service of night prayer that really flows like a blue Christmas service. And if you're familiar with what a blue Christmas service is, 
Uh, it's typically held around the 21st of December every year, also known as the longest night. It's a service of mourning, a service of prayer, a service of hearing readings of scripture that can encourage us. And tonight it seems very fitting that especially as we end out this week of power and the spirit and close out our observance of Advent together, we focus a little bit on uh, hearing scriptures that uplift us, especially in light of the pandemic this past year in our nation and our world. We hope that uh, all of the worship this week has been meaningful, uplifting, and meditative for you, and we hope that tonight's worship will be the same. The light of our Lord Jesus Christ, the warmth of God, and the hope of the Holy Spirit be with you all. And also with you. And you set lights in the sky to govern the night and day. 
In a pillar of cloud by day, in a pillar of fire by night, you led your people into freedom. Enlighten our darkness by the light of your Christ. May your word be a lamp to our feet and a light to our path. For you are merciful, and you love your whole creation. And with all your creatures, we give you glory through your Son, Jesus Christ, in the unity of the Holy Spirit, now and forever. Amen. A responsive reading of Psalm 27. <coughs> the Lord is my light and my salvation. Whom shall I fear? The Lord is the stronghold of my life. Of whom shall I be afraid? When evil when the Lord is assailed me to devour my flesh, my adversaries and foes, they shall stumble and fall. Though an army encamp against me, my heart shall not fear. Though war rise up against me, yet I will be confident. One thing I ask of the Lord, that will I seek after, to live in the house of the Lord all the days of my life, to behold the beauty of the Lord, and to inquire in his temple. For he will hide me in his shelter in the day of trouble. He will conceal me under the cover of his tent. He will set me high on a rock. Now my hand is lifted up above my enemies all around me, and I will offer in his tent sacrifices with shouts of joy, and I will sing and make melody to the Lord. Hear, O Lord, when I cry aloud, be gracious to me and answer me. Come, on, my heart says, seek his face. Your face, Lord, to my life. Do not harm your hide your face from me. Do not turn your servant away in anger, you who have been my help. Do not cast me off. Do not forsake me, O God of my salvation. If my, my father and mother forsake me, the Lord will take me up. Teach me your way, O Lord, and lead me on a level path because of my enemies. Do, Do not give me up to the will of my adversaries, for false witnesses have risen against me. And they are breathing in our fights. I believe that I shall see the goodness of the Lord in the land of the living. Wait, Wait for the Lord, be strong, strong and let your heart take courage. Wait, Wait for the Lord. Creator of the stars of night, bless the long hours of this night with the warmth of your presence. Come to all who suffer in any way. Grant rest to the weary, freedom to those who are burdened, and bright hope to those who despair. Strengthen us as we await your coming once again, through Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. Amen. A reading from Isaiah, the 40th chapter, beginning in the first verse. Comfort, O oh comfort, my people, says you God, says your God. Speak tenderly to Jerusalem and cry to her that she has served her turn, that her penalty is paid, that she has received from the Lord's hand double for all her sins. A voice cries out, In the wilderness prepare the way of the Lord, make straight in the desert a highway for our God. Every valley shall be lifted up, and every mountain and hill be made low. The uneven ground shall become level in the rough places of plain. Then the glory of the Lord shall be revealed, and all people shall see it together. For the mouth of the Lord has spoken. A voice cries, a voice says, cry out. And I said, what shall I cry? All people are grass. Their constancy is like the flower of the field. The grass withers, the flower fades. When the breath of the Lord blows upon it, surely the people are grass. The grass withers, the flower fades, but the word of our God will stand forever. Get you up to a high mountain, O Zion, herald of good tidings. Lift up your voice with strength, O Jerusalem, herald of good tidings. Lift it up, do not fear. Say to the cities of Judah, 
Here is your God. See, the Lord God comes with might, and his arm rules for him. His reward is with him, and his recompense before him. He will feed his flock like a shepherd. He will gather the lambs in his arms and carry them in his bosom and gently lead the mother sheep. Yes. 
of 1 John, the first chapter. We declare to you what was from the beginning, what we have heard, what we have seen with our eyes, what we have looked at and touched with our hands concerning the word of life. This life was revealed, and we have seen it and testified to it, and declare to you the eternal life that was with the Father and was revealed to us. We declare to you what we have seen and heard, so that you also may have fellowship with us. And truly, our fellowship is with the Father and with His Son, Jesus Christ. We are writing these things so that our joy may be complete. God of Hagar, God of Sarah, God of
Thank you again, George Donovan. Thank you again, Pastor Kathy Mims. Thank you again to all of you for being part of Power in the Spirit, Advent in July. I look forward to welcoming you uh, through this means in midwinter 2022 and um, back to Roanoke College in uh, July of 2022. Uh, you are welcome to stick around if you have a question for me or, or for anybody from the Synod staff. Um, but otherwise, I will say uh, peace be with you and Merry Christmas. Same to you, David. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, David. Hi, Dave. Hi. <laughs> <laughs>